Volume One, Chapter Six of Diana Temple by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Six. Ready money of affection, pay whoever drew the bill. Clough. Put not your trust in brothers," said Di, coming in from a balcony after the departure of the bride and bridegroom, and looking round the crowded drawing room where the fictitious gaiety of a wedding was more or less dismally stamped on every face. "'I do believe Archie has deserted me.' "'I know he has,' said her companion. "'He told me half an hour ago that he was going to bolt.' "'Did he? The deceiver. He gave me a solemn promise that he would see me home. I believe young men are the root of all evil. Don't pin your faith to them, Lord Hemsworth, or you will live to rue it, like me.' "'I won't.' "'And why, pray, did you not mention the fact that he was going when I was laboriously explaining all the presents to you, and exhausting myself in pointing out watches in bracelets or concealed in the handles of umbrellas, which you were quite unable to see for yourself? One good turn deserves another. Ah, now the people are really beginning to go. Is not that Lady Breakwater in the inner drawing-room? Poor woman, I, I mean happy mother. I'll try and get near her to say good-bye. Look at her smiling.' I think I should know a wedding smiled anywhere. "'No, you need not see me home,' she added a few minutes later, as she stood in the hall. "'Have I not a hard broom? One throws expense to the winds on an occasion of this kind. There comes your handsome behind it. What a lovely chestnut! How I do envy you it! The blessings of this world are very unevenly distributed. Good-bye.' "'I am going to see you home,' said Lord Hemsworth, with decision. It is the duty of the best man to make himself generally useful to the chief bridesmaid. I read it in my little etiquette book, and however painful my duty may be made to me, I shall perform it. You have performed it thoroughly already. No, you are not coming in. Don't shut the door on my gown, please. Thanks. Home, coachman. Are you going to the speaker's to-night? said Lord Hemsworth, with his arms on the carriage door, perfectly regardless of the string of carriages behind him. I am. Good luck, so am I. That's not in the etiquette book, said Di, with mischief in her eyes. In the meantime you are stopping the whole procession. We've shaken hands once already. Good-bye again. Mrs. Courtney was sitting in her armchair with her back to the light in the long, sunny drawing-room of her little house in Kensington, waiting for the return of her granddaughter from the wedding, to which at the last moment she had been unable to escort her herself. Her headache was better now, and she had taken up her work, the fine elaborate lace-work, in imitation of an old design which she had copied in some Italian church. Mrs. Courtney had been one of the four beautiful Miss Digbys of Eberston, about whom society had gone wild fifty years ago. And in her old age she was beautiful still, with the dignified and gracious manner of one who has been worshipped in her day. Her calm, keen face bore the marks of much suffering, but of suffering that had been outlived. Perhaps next to the death of her husband, who had left her in her early youth to struggle with life alone, the blow which she had felt most keenly had been the clandestine and most miserable marriage of her only daughter with Colonel Tempest. But it was all past now. People, while they are undergoing the strain of the ordinary ills that flesh is heir to, the bitterness of inadequately returned love, the loss or alienation of children, the grind of poverty or the hydra-headed wants of insufficient wealth, are not, as a rule, pleasant or sympathetic companions. The lessons of life are coming too quickly upon them to allow of it. They are preoccupied. But tout passe. Mrs. Courtney had loved and had suffered, and had presented a brave front to the world, and had known wealth, as she now knew poverty. The pain was past, the experience remained. Therein lay the secret of her power and her popularity, for she had both. She seemed to have reached a little quiet backwater in the river of life, where the pressure of the current could no longer reach her, would never reach her again. She sometimes said that nothing could affect her very deeply now, except perhaps what affected her granddaughter. But that was a large exception. Mrs. Courtney loved her granddaughter with some of the t stern, tender affection which she had once lavished on her own daughter, which she had buried in her grave. 
The elder Diana had taken two hearts down to the grave with her, her mother's and Mr. Tempest's. Mrs. Courtney had that rarest gift, a heart at leisure from itself to soothe and sympathise. To that little house in Kensington many came, long before her beautiful granddaughter was of an age to be its principal attraction, as she had now become. Mrs. Courtney's house had gained the magic name of being agreeable, possibly because she made it so to one and all alike. None but the pushing and the dictatorial were ever overlooked. Country relations with the loud voices and the abusive political views peculiar to rural life were her worst bugbears, but even they had a pleasing suspicion that they had distinguished themselves in conversation, and had departed with the gratified feeling akin to that depicted on a plain woman's face when she has come out well in a photograph. In talking with the young, Mrs. Courtney remembered her own far-away youth, its romantic passions, its watchful nights, its splendour of sunrise illusions. She remembered, too, its great ignorance, and was not, like so many elders, exasperated with the youth for having omitted to learn, before they came into the world, what they themselves only learned by living half a century in it. She had sympathy with old and young alike, but perhaps she felt most deeply for those who were struggling in the meshes of middle age, no longer interesting to others, or even to themselves. Many came to Mrs. Courtney for comfort and sympathy in the servitude with hard labour of middle age, and none came in vain. Mrs. Courtney lifted her calm, clear eyes to the Louis XIV clock on the old Venetian cabinet near her. "'Die is late,' she said, half aloud. The low sun was thinking better of it, and was shining in through the tracery of the bare branches of the trees outside. If there was ever a ray of sunshine anywhere, it was in that little Kensington drawing-room. The sun never forgot to seek it out, to come and have a look at the little possessions, which in spite of her narrow means Mrs. Courtney had gradually gathered round her. It came now, and touched the white Capo di Monte figures on the mantelpiece, and brought into momentary prominence the inlaid ivory dolphins on the ebony cabinet, those dolphins with curly tails which two Dianas had loved at the age when permission to drive dolphins and sit on waves was not a final impossibility, though denied for the moment. It lighted up the groups of lowest off China, and the tall oriental jars which Mrs. Courtney suffered no one to dust but herself. The little bits of old silver and enamel on the black polished table caught the light. So did the daffodils in the green valorous tripod. They blazed against the shadowed, pictured wall. The quiet room was full of light. Presently a carriage stopped at the door. The bell rang, and a moment later a swift, light step mounted the stair, and Di came in, tall and radiant in her flowing white and yellow draperies, her bouquet of mimosa in her hand. She was beautiful, with a beauty that is recognised at once. Beauty is so rare nowadays, and prettiness so common, that the terms are often confused and misapplied, and the most ordinary good looks usurp the name of beauty. But between prettiness and beauty there is nevertheless a great gulf fixed. No one had ever called Di a pretty girl. At one-and-twenty she was a beautiful woman, with that nameless air of distinction which can ennoble the plainest face and figure. She had a right to beauty from both parents, and resembled both of them to a certain degree. She had the tall, splendid figure of the Tempests, with their fair skin and pale golden hair, waving back thick and burnished from her low white forehead. But she had her mother's dark, unfathomable eyes with the long, dark eyelashes, and her mother's features with their inherent nobility and strength, which were so entirely lacking in the Tempests, at least in the present generation of them. Some people, women mostly, said there was too much contrast between her dark eyes and eyebrows and the extreme fairness of her complexion and hair. Men, however, did not think so. They saw that she was beautiful, and that was enough. Indeed, it was too much for some of them. Women said also that her features were too large, that she was on too large a scale altogether. No doubt that accounted for the fact that she was seldom overlooked. "'Well, Granny, and how is the headache?' she asked gaily, 
pulling off her long gloves and instantly beginning to unwire the mimosa in her bouquet with rapid, capable white hands. "'Oh, the headache is gone,' said Mrs. Courtney, watching her granddaughter. "'And how did it all go off?' "'Perfectly,' said Di, in her clear, gay voice. "'Madeline looked beautiful, and often as I have been bridesmaid, I never stood behind a bride with a better fitting back. I suppose the survival of the best fitted is what we are coming to in these days. Anyhow, Madeleine attained to it. It was a well-done thing altogether. The altar, one mass of white peonies. White peonies at Easter! Sir Henry was the only red one there. And eight of us, all youth and innocence, in white and amber, to bear her company. We bridesmaids were all waiting for her for some time before she arrived, or he either. But Lord Hemsworth marched him at last, just when I was beginning to hope he would not turn up. I have seen him look worse, Granny. He did not look so very bald until he knelt down, and I have known his nose redder. To a friend, I dare say, it only looked like a blush that had lost its way. He is a stout man to outline himself in a white waistcoat, but I thought on the whole he looked well. Aye, said Mrs. Courtney, with her little inward laugh, you should not say such things. Oh, yes, I could say anything I like to you, said Di. Dear me, I am sitting on my new amber sash. What extravagance! It will be long enough before I have another. It was really good of Lady Breakwater to give me the whole turnout. We never could have afforded it. Did Madeline look unhappy? No, she was pale, but perfectly collected, and she walked quite firmly to the chancel steps, where the security for fifteen thousand a year and two diamond tiaras and a pendant was awaiting her. Security looked a little nervous. "'Die,' said Mrs. Courtney, with an effect after severity. "'Never again let me hear you laugh at the man who once did you the honour to ask you to marry him. You show great want of feeling.' Di's face changed. It became several degrees sterner than her grandmother's. That peculiar, concentrated light came into her soft, lovely eyes, which is a lifelong puzzle to those who can see only one aspect of a character and whose ideas are consequently thrown into the wildest confusion by a change of expression. There was at times an appearance of intensity of feeling about Di, which sometimes gleamed up into her eyes and gave a certain tremor to her low voice, that surprised and almost frightened those who regarded her only as a charming but somewhat eccentric woman. Di's best friends said they could not understand her. The little foot-rule by which they measured others did not seem to apply to her. She was grave or gay, cynical or tender, frivolous or sympathetic, according to the mood of the hour, or according as her quick intuition and sense of mischief showed her the exact opposite was expected of her. But behind the various moods which naturally high spirits led her into for the moment, keener eyes could see that there was always something kept back something not suffered to be discussed and commented on by the crowd, namely, herself. Her frank, cordial manner might deceive the many, but others who knew her better were conscious of a great reserve, of a barrier beyond which they might not pass, of locked rooms in that sunny, hospitable house into which no one was invited, into which she had, perhaps as yet, rarely penetrated herself. Mrs. Courtney possibly understood her better than any one, but Di took her by surprise now. She laid down her flowers, and came and stood before her grandmother. "'Do I show want of feeling?' she said in her low, even voice. "'I know I have none for that man, but why should I have any? If he wanted to marry me, why did he want it? He knew I did not like him. I made that sufficiently plain.' Did he care one single straw for anything about me except my looks? If he had liked me ever so little, he would have been different. But why am I to be so grateful because he wanted me to sit at the head of his table and wear his diamonds? You talk as young and silly girls with romantic ideas do talk, replied Mrs. Courtney, piqued into making assertions exactly contrary to her real opinions. I fancied you had more sense. Madeline did a wise thing in accepting him. She's made a very prudent marriage. Yes, said Di, moving slowly away and sitting down by the window. That is just it. I wonder if there is anything in the whole wide world so recklessly imprudent as a prudent marriage. 
But what am I talking about? She added lightly. It is not a marriage, it is merely a social contract. I can't see why they went to church myself, or what the peonies and that nice little newly ironed bishop were for. They were quite unnecessary. A register office and a clerk would have done just as well, and have been more in keeping. But how silly it is of me to be wasting my time in holding forth when your cap is not even trimmed for this evening. The price of a virtuous woman is above rubies nowadays. Nothing but diamonds and settlements will secure a first-rate article. And now, to come back to more serious subjects, will you wear your diamond stars, G? G was the irreverent pet name by which Di sometimes called her grandmother. Or shall I fasten that little marabou feather with your pearl clasp into the point-lace cap? It wants something at the side. I think I will wear the diamonds, said Mrs. Courtney thoughtfully. People are beginning to wear their jewels again now. Only sew them in firmly, Di. You should have seen the array of jewellery to-day, said Di, still in the same tone, arranging the mimosa in clusters about the room. Other people's diamonds seem to take all the starch out of me. A kind of limpness comes over me when I look at tiaras, and there was such a riviere and pendant, and a little handsome cab and horse in diamonds as a brooch. I should like to be tempted by a brooch like that. Sir Henry has his good points, after all. I see now that it is too late. And why do people sprinkle themselves all over with watches nowadays, Granny, in unexpected places? Lord Hemsworth counted five, or was it six, set in different presents. There were two, I think, in bracelets, one in a fan, and one in the handle of an umbrella. What can be the use of a watch in the handle of an umbrella? Then there was a very little one in, what was it, a paper-knife, set round with large diamonds. It made me feel quite unwell to look at it when I thought how what had been spent on that silly thing would have dressed you and me, Granny, for a year. That reminds me, I shall tear off this amber sash and put it on my white militant dinner-gown. You must not give me any more white gowns. They are done for directly. I like to see you in white. Oh, so do I, just as much as I like to see you, Granny, in brocade. But it can't be done. I won't have you spending so much on me. If I'm a pauper, I don't mind looking like one." She looked very unlike one, as she gathered up her gloves and lace handkerchief and bouquet holder, and left the room. And yet they were very poor. No one knew on how small a number of hundreds that little home was kept together. How narrow was the margin which allowed of those occasional little dinner-parties of eight to which people were so glad to come. Who was likely to divine that the two black satin chairs had been covered by Di's strong hands, that the pale oriental coverings on the settees and sofas that harmonised so well with the subdued colouring of the room were the results of her powers of upholstery, that it was Di who mounted boldly on high steps and painted her own room and her grandmother's an elegant pink distemper, inciting the servants to go and do likewise for themselves? It was easy to see they were poor but it was generally supposed that they had the species of limited means which wealth is so often kind enough to envy, with its old formula that the truly rich are those who have nothing to keep up. This is true if the narrow means have not caused the wants to become so circumscribed that nothing further remains that can be put down. The rich, one would imagine, are those who, whatever their income may be, have it in their power to put down an unnecessary expense but probably all expenses are essentially necessary to the wealthy. Mrs. Courtney and her granddaughter lived very quietly, and went without effort, and indeed as a matter of course, into the society which is labelled, whether rightly or wrongly, as good. Persons of narrow means too often slip out of the class to which they naturally belong, because they can give nothing in return for what they receive. They may have a thousand virtues, and be far superior in their domestic relations to those who forget them, but they are forgotten all the same. Society is rigorous, and gives nothing for nothing. But others there are whose poverty makes no difference to them, who are welcomed with cordiality, and have reserved seats everywhere, because, though they cannot pay in kind, they have other means at their disposal. Their very presence is an overpayment. Everyone who goes into society must, in some form or other, as Mrs. Lynn Linton expresses it, pay their shot.' 
All the doors were open to Mrs. Courtney and her granddaughter, not because they were handsomer than other people, not because they belonged by birth to good society and were only to be seen at the best houses, but because, wherever they went, they were felt to be an acquisition, and one not invariably to be obtained. Madeline had been glad to book Di at once as one of her bridesmaids. Indeed, she had long professed a great affection for the younger girl, with whom she had nothing in common, but whose beauty rendered it probable that she might eventually make a brilliant match. As the bridesmaid sat down, rather wearily, in her own room, and unfastened the diamond monogram brooch, the gift of the bridegroom, the tears that had been in her heart all day came into her eyes. Dies slow, difficult tears. What a mass of illusions are torn from us by the first applauded mercenary marriage that comes very near to us in our youth. Death, when he draws nigh for the first time, at least leaves us our illusions. But this voluntary death in life, from which there is no resurrection, filled Dye's soul with loathing compassion. She bowed her fair head on her hands, and wept, over the girl who had never been her friend, but whose fate might at one time have been her own. End of Volume 1, Chapter 6volume 1 chapter 7 of diana temple by mary chumley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 1 chapter 7 broad his shoulders are and strong and his eye is scornful threatening and young emerson there was the usual crush at the speakers the usual sprinkling of stars and orders and splendid uniforms if it made Di feel limp to look at other people's diamonds, she would be very limp to-night. Two men, with their backs to the wall, somewhat withdrawn from the moving pressure of the crowd, were commenting, in the absolute privacy of a large gathering, on the stream of arrivals. "'Who is that old parchment face of the eyeglass?' asked the younger man, whose bleached eyes and moustache betokened foreign service. "'Which? Coming in now looks as if he had seen a thing or two. There!' He's talking to one of the Arden twins. That man, that is Lord Frederick Fane, an old reprobate. See, he's buttonholed Hemsworth. I should like to hear what he's saying to him. Look how his eye twinkles. He's one of our instructors of youth. Hemsworth has been standing there for the last half hour. He is waiting. Anybody can see that. So am I, though not for the same person. Whom are you looking for? for? Do you see that dark man with the high nose talking to the post office? There, the Duchess of Southwark has just spoken to him and is introducing her daughter. Do you mean that ugly beggar with a clean-shaved face and heavy jaw? I don't see that he's so ugly. He's got a head on his shoulders, and his face means something, which is more than you can say of many. There's no lack of ability there. He is one of the men of the future, and people are beginning to find it out. He's not taken any line in politics yet, but he's bound to soon. Both sides want him, of course. He's one of our most promising commoners, Tempest of Overley. The younger man glanced at the square-shouldered, erect figure and strong, dark face with deep interest. Is he the man about whom there was a lawsuit when his father died? Yes. Colonel Tempest brought an action, but he lost it. There was no evidence forthcoming, though there was very little doubt how matters really stood. He's not like the Tempest. No, if you want a Tempest, pure and simple— Look at the man with tar-coloured hair in the further doorway, making running with a little soda-water heiress. That's a regular Tempest style. Oh, he's too beautiful. He's overdone it, said the other. If he were less handsome, he would be better looking, and his hair looks like a wig. He has the face of a fool on him. The last two generations have had no grit in them. Jack Tempest, the last man, might have done something, but he never came to the fore. He was a trustworthy conservative, but not an energetic man like his father, the old minister, who lies in Westminster Abbey. Perhaps the present man will come to the fore. Perhaps. I know he will. You can see it in his face. And he has the prestige of his name and wealth to back him. But I don't notice which side he'll take. I know that he voted right at the last election, but so did half the Liberals. I'm inclined to think he has liberal leanings, 
but he refused to stand three years ago for the family constituency, which is an absolute certainty in whatever he professes himself. And he has been secretary to the embassy at St. Petersburg for the last three years. He's very like his mother's family, except that the Fanes are not so ugly. Of course he's like his mother's family. It's an open secret. Look at him now. He's speaking to Lord Frederick Fane, his mother's uh, first cousin. There's a family resemblance for you. I wonder they stand together. His companion drew in his breath. The likeness between the elder man and the younger one was unmistakable. "'Does he know, do you think?' he asked after a moment. "'Of course he must know that there is a but about himself. People don't grow up in ignorance of such things. But I think he does not know that it is more than a suspicion, that it is a moral certainty, and that Lord Frederick— But it is seven and twenty years ago, and it is half forgotten now. He's not the only heir with a doubt about him. He will be a credit to the Tempest, anyhow. If the property had fallen into the hands of those two thieves, Colonel Tempest and his son, there would not have been much left of him for the next generation. Ah, oh, it's frankly hot, said the younger man. I shall bolt. Just home from Africa and find it hot, said the other. Ah, with sudden interest, looking back to the doorway. I thought so. Hemsworth was not waiting for nothing. By God, she is handsome, and what a figure! She's the tallest woman in the room, except Lady Delmore's two yards of unmanageable maypole. Look how she moves, and the way her head is set on her shoulders. If I had not a wife and seven children, I should make a fool of myself. I remember her mother, just as handsome twenty years ago, but not so brilliant, and with an unhappy look about her. Hang, Tempest, I won't wait any longer for him. I must go and speak to her before Hemsworth takes possession of her. You take my advice, John, said Lord Frederick Fane, confidentially to his kinsman. Don't tie yourself to a party any more than you would to a woman. Leave that for fools like Hemsworth. Just go your own way and give no one a claim on you. I intend to go my own way when I have decided where I want to go. But in the meantime, don't commit yourself. Always leave yourself a loophole. I don't see the use of worrying about loopholes if I don't want to back out of anything. I should never consciously put it myself anywhere where it might be necessary to wriggle out on all fours. No, I dare say. I thought all that in my salad days, but you'll grow out of it as you get older. You'll chip your shell, John, like the rest of us, ha <laughs> ha, and not be above a shift. There's not a man who won't stoop to a shift on a pinch, provided the pinch is sharp enough, any more than there is a woman, bespoken or otherwise, who does not like being made love to, provided it is done the right way. That's my experience. Lord Frederick's experience was that of most men of his stamp, the crown of whose maturer years, earned by a youth of strenuous self-indulgence, is a disbelief in the human nature. Secret contempt of women, coupled with a smooth and adulatory manner towards them, show any too plainly the school in which these opinions have been formed. "'Look at Hemsworth,' continued Lord Frederick, as Mrs. Courtney and Di and Lord Hemsworth in close attendance were being gradually drifted towards the room in which they were standing. "'If Hemsworth goes on giving that girl a hold of him, he will find himself deuced uncomfortable one of these days.' He'd better hold hard while he can. Discretion is the better part of valour. I have been telling him so. Why should he hold hard? said John, rather absently. After all, none but the brave deserve the fair. A none but the brave can live with some of them. Ha! <laughs> ha! said Lord Frederick, chuckling. There are cheaper ways of getting out of love than by marriage. But she is a fine woman. Hensworth has got eyes in his head, I must own. I remember being dreadfully in love with her mother nearly thirty years ago, and she with me. She had that sort of stand-off manner which takes some men more than anything. It did me. I wonder more women don't adopt it. I very nearly married her. Ha! <laughs> ha! But, Tempest, your uncle made a fool of himself while I hesitated and was wretched with her, poor devil. I never had such a shave since. Upon my word, putting up his eyeglass, if I were a young man I think I'd marry die, Tempest. Those large women wear well, John. They don't shrivel up to nothing like Mrs. Graham, or expand like Lady Torrington, that emblem of plenty without waste. Ha, <laughs> ha! Look at Mrs. Courtney, too. There's a fine old pelican with an eye to the main chance. Always look at the mother and the grandmother, if you can. But she's on too large a scale for you. Not in the least, said John calmly. 
I cherish thoughts of Miss Delmore, who is quite three inches taller. Oh, don't marry a Delmore. They are too thin. Those girls have neither mind, body, nor estate. I've seen two generations of them. They have a sort of prettiness when they are quite new. But look at our married sisters. They all look as if they've shrunk in the wash. I must go and speak to Mrs. Courtney, said John, from whose impenetrable face it would have been difficult to judge whether his companion's style of conversation amused or disgusted him. Three years' absence blunts the recollection of one's sins. And he moved away towards the next room. The recollection of a good many people, however, had apparently not become blunted, and it was some time before he could make his way to Mrs. Courtney, who was talking with a Turkish ambassador and revolutionising his ideas of English women. She was genuinely glad to see John, having known him from a boy. "'You know your cousin Diana, of course,' she said, as Di came towards them. "'Indeed I do not,' said John. "'I asked who she was at the Thesinger wedding to-day, and found myself in the ludicrous position of not knowing my own first cousin.' "'Not recognising her, you mean?' said Mrs. Courtney. "'Surely you must have seen her often in my house before you went abroad.' But I suppose she was in a chrysalis schoolroom state then, and has emerged into young ladyhood since. Here is your cousin saying he does not know you. Continued Mrs. Courtney, turning to Di. John, this is Di. Di, this is your first cousin, John Tempest. Both bowed, and then thought better of it, and shook hands. Their eyes met on the exact level of equal height, and the steady, keen glance that passed between was like the meeting of two formidable powers. Each was taken by surprise. It was as if, instead of shaking hands, they had suddenly measured swords. "'If you don't know each other, you ought to,' continued Mrs. Courtney. "'Lord Hemsworth, what is that unwholesome-looking compound you've got hold of?' Uh, "'Lemonade for Miss Tempest.' "'Kindly fetch me some, too.' And Mrs. Courtney turned away to continue her conversation with the Turk, who was still hovering near, and whose bead-like eyes under his red fez showed a decided envy of John. He and I were standing in the doorway that led into the last room where the refreshments were, and a stream of people beginning at that moment to press out again pressed them back into the room they had just been leaving. "'I shall upset this down someone's back in another minute and make an enemy of for life,' said Di, holding a dull ass as best as she could. She would have given anything at that instance to say something unusually frivolous in order to shake off the impression of the moment before. But her frivolity had temporarily departed with Lord Hemsworth. "'Don't oppose the stream. Subside into this backwater,' said John, placing his square shoulders between the throng and herself, and nodding to a recess by one of the high arched windows. Having reached it, Di sipped the high-water mark off her lemonade. "'It's safe now,' she said. "'I don't know why I took it. I don't want it now I've got it.' "'Have you seen Archer since you came back? "'You know him, of course. "'He often talks about you.' "'Yes, I saw him at the Thessinger wedding today. "'Were you there?' Oh, "'Yes, but only at the church. "'I didn't go on to the house. "'I disliked the whole affair too much. "'Many marriages, half the marriages one sees, "'are only irrevocable flirtations. "'But the ceremony of today was not even that.' Di looked away through the mullioned window, out across the river and its gliding shimmer, to the lights beyond. She did not know how long it was before she spoke. "'I think it was a great sin,' she said at last, in a low voice, unconscious of a pause that to her companion was full of meaning. "'Or a great mistake,' he said gently. "'No, not a mistake,' said Di, still looking out. The others, the irrevocable flirtations, are the mistakes. There was no mistake to-day. But it was a dull wedding, she added with sudden self-recollection and a change of manner. Not like one I was at last autumn in the country. I was staying in the same house as the bridegroom, and he and the best man, a Mr. Lumley, got up at an early hour, woke some of the other men, and paraded the house with an impromptu band of music. I remember the bridegroom performed piercingly upon the comb. I wonder people ever play the comb, it is so plaintive. But perhaps it is your favourite instrument, perfected in the course of foreign travel, and I am trampling on your feelings unawares. I used to play it, 
said John, but not of late years. I left it off because it tickled and increased the natural melancholy of my disposition. What were the other instruments? Let me see. Lord Hemsworth murmured upon a gong, and Mr. Lumby uttered his dark speech upon a tray. The whole was very effective. He told me afterwards that it was such a relief to his feelings which had been much lacerated by the misplaced affections of the bride. Dye's laughing, mischievous eyes met John's fixed upon her with a grave attention that took her aback. She had an uncomfortable sense that he was regarding her with secret amusement. A moment before she had been sorry that she had inadvertently spoken with a force that was unusual to her. Now she was equally vexed that she had been flippant. "'Here you are,' said Lord Hemsworth, elbowing his way up to them. "'I've been looking for you everywhere. Mrs. Courtney is going and is asking for you.' End of Volume 1 Chapter 7Volume 1, Chapter 8 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8 Si que papillon, un jour, puisses tu trouver l'amour, et perdre tes ailes. Die, said Mrs. Courtney, as they drove away at last, after the usual half-hour's waiting for the carriage, the tedium of which Lord Hemsworth had exerted himself to relieve. Do you usually talk quite so much nonsense to Lord Hemsworth as you did to-night? Generally, Granny, yes, I think it was about the usual quantity. Sometimes it's rather more, a good deal more, when you're not there. Mrs. Courtney was silent for a few minutes. You're making a mistake, Di, she said at last. How, ah, Granny? In your manner to Lord Hemsworth, you make yourself cheap to him. A woman should never do that. Di did not answer. "'When I was young,' said Mrs. Courtney, "'I should have been proud to have been admired by a man of his stamp.' "'So should I,' said Di quietly, "'if it had not like him so much.' "'You do like him, then?' "'I do, and I mean to act on the square by him.' "'I don't know what you mean.' "'Yes, you do, Granny, perfectly. "'I've known him too long to alter my manner to him. "'I know him by heart. "'If I wanted to begin to be serious and reserved with him, if I once fail to keep him at arm's length, which talking nonsense does, his feeling towards me, which only amuses him now, will become serious too. Lord Hemsworth is not so superficial as he seems. He would have been in earnest before now, if I would have let him. And he is the kind of man who could be very much in earnest. I can't help his playing with edged tools, but I can prevent him cutting himself. My dear, he is in love with you now, and has been for the last six months. "'Yes,' said Di, "'he is, in a way. "'But it would be much worse if he had had encouragement.' "'And what do you call allowing him to talk to you for half an hour on the stairs "'if it is not encouragement? "'You may be certain there was not a creature there "'who did not think you were encouraging him.' "'I don't mind what creatures think as long as I don't do the thing. "'And he knows well enough I don't.' "'Why not do it if you like him?' "'Well, Granny,' said Di, after a pause, the way I look at it is this. I don't mean only about Lord Hemsworth, but about any one who, well, who is interested in me, really interested in me, I mean, not one of the sham ones who wants to pass the time. I never consider them. I, I say something like this to myself. Di, do you observe that man? Yes, I say, my eyes upon them. Are you aware that he will come and speak to you the first instant he can? Yes, I know that. Look at him well. Then I look at him. What do you think of him? He's rather nice-looking, I say, and he is pleasant to talk to, and he has the right sort of collars. I, I like him. Die, I say to myself very solemnly. You have no idea how solemn I am on these occasions. Are you willing to prefer him to the rest of the whole universe, to listen to his conversation for the remainder of your natural life, to knock under to him entirely, in short, to take him and his collars for better for worse? "'No, of course not,' I say indignantly. "'I should not think of such a thing.' "'Then,' I reply, "'you have no earthly right to let him think you might be persuaded to, "'or to allow him to take a single one of the preliminary steps in that direction, "'however gratifying it may be to your vanity to see him do it, "'or however sorry you may be to lose him. 
He is paying you the highest compliment a man can pay a woman. One good turn deserves another. He has seen you looking at him. Here he comes to try the first rung of the ladder. Stop it at once, for he has climbed high enough for a fall. He will soon go away if he thinks you are heartless and frivolous. Well, then, he is a good fellow. He deserves it at your hands. Let him think you are heartless, and send him away none the worse. That is something of what I feel about men. I mean the nice ones, Granny. Mrs. Courtney raised her eyes to the ceiling of the carriage, and her two hands made a simultaneous upheaval under her voluminous wraps. Her hopes for Lord Hemsworth had suffered a severe shock during the last few minutes, and words were a relief. Of all the egregious folly I have been in the course of a long life, she remarked, I think that takes the palm. How do you suppose any woman in the whole world, or man either, would marry if they looked at marriage like that? Things come gradually. Not with me, Granny, said Di promptly. Either I see them, or I don't see them. And at the beginning I always look on to the end, just as one does in a novel to see whether it is worth reading. I can't pretend to myself when I walk in the direction of church bells that I don't know I shall arrive at the church in the end, however pleasant the walk may be. "'You will never marry, so you may as well make up your mind to it,' said Mrs. Courtney, who was already revolving an entirely new idea in her mind, which cast Lord Hemsworth completely into the shade. "'If you are so fond of looking at the future, you had better amuse yourself by pitching yourself as a penniless old maid.' "'I wish there was something one could be between an old maid and a married woman,' said Di. "'I think if I had my choice, I'd be a widow.' Mrs. Courtney, somewhat propitiated by her new idea, gave her silent but visible laugh, and I went on. "'What do you think of John Tempest, Granny? He's so black that talking of widows reminded me of him.' Mrs. Courtney sustained a slight nervous shock. "'I had not much conversation with him,' she said, stifling a slight yawn. "'I'm glad to see him back in England. Remind me to ask him next time we have a dinner-party.' "'He looks clever.' said Di. Ugly men sometimes do. It is a way they have. It does not matter how ugly a man is if he looks like a gentleman. Not a bit, said Di. I'm only sorry he looks as if he had been cut out with a blunt pair of scissors because he is a tempest, and tempests ought to be handsome to keep up the family traditions. Look at the old man in Westminster Abbey. I am proud of his nose whenever I look at it. I wish the present head of the family had kept a firmer hold on that feature, that's all. And, it being a hook, I should have thought he might easily have done so. I think it is a want of good taste to bring the Fain features so prominently to Overly, don't you? Archie represents the looks of the family, certainly. And so do I, Granny. Though I believe you fondly imagine I am not aware of it. But it does not matter so much what we look like, as it does with the head of the family. The family has got a head to it for the first time for two generations, remarked Mrs. Courtney closing the conversation by putting on her respirator. As Lord Hemsworth turned away from putting Mrs. Courtney and Di into their carriage, he saw John coming down the steps. "'Still here,' he said. "'I thought you'd gone hours ago.' "'It is a fine night,' said John, who did not think it necessary to say that he was still there. "'I think I shall walk.' "'But so will I,' replied Lord Hemsworth, and they went out together. John and Lord Hemsworth had known each other since the Eton days, and had that sort of quiet liking for each other which has the germ of friendship in it, which circumstances may eventually quicken or destroy. As they turned into Whitehall, a hansom, one of many, passed them at a foot's pace with its usual civil interrogatory. Cab, sir? That cab horse with the white stocking reminds me, said Lord Hemsworth. I shall get a bay mare at Tattersall's today for my team. I wish you could come and see her, Tempest. I like her looks. She's a good match to the other babe, but she has a white stocking. I don't see any harm in one, said John, with interest, but it rather depends on the rest of the team. That is just it, said Lord Hemsworth. I drive a scratch team this year, two greys and two bays with black points. She's right at height, good action, not too high, and has been driven as a wheeler, which is what I want her for, but I don't like the idea of a white stocking among them. And, 
Talking of one of the subjects that most Englishmen have in common, they proceeded slowly past the horse-guards and into Trafalgar Square. "'Tempest,' said Lord Hemsworth, after a time, "'do you know it strikes me very forcibly that we are being followed?' "'Not likely,' said John. "'Not at all likely, but the fact all the same. "'Look there. "'That is the same handsome waiting at the corner "'that hailed us as we came out of the gates. "'I know him by the white stocking. "'I should imagine there might be about five hundred and one cab-horses "'with white stockings in London.' "'I dare say. "'But I know a horse again when I see him just as much as I know a face. "'I bet you anything you like that it's the same horse.' "'I dare say it is,' said John absently. Lord Hemsworth said nothing more. They walked up St. James's Street in silence. "'I have taken rooms here for the moment,' said John, stopping at the corner of King Street. "'I'll come round to Tattersall's about two to-morrow. Good night.' Lord Hemsworth bade him good night, and then walked on up St. James's Street. There were a few hansoms on the stand. The last, which was in the act of drawing up behind the others, had a horse with a white stocking. "'Now!' said Lord Hemsworth to himself. We will see whether it is Tempest or me he is after, for I am certain it is one of us. He stopped short near the cab-stand, and, striking a light, lit a cigarette, holding the match so that his face was plainly visible. Then he proceeded leisurely on his way, and turned down Piccadilly. There were a good many people in the street, and a certain number of carriages. Presently he stopped under a somewhat dark archway, and threw away his cigarette. "'No,' he said, after carefully watching for some time the cabs and carriages which passed. "'Nothing more to be seen of our friend. I wonder what's up. It's Tempest he was after, not me.'" End of Volume 1, Chapter 8「Volume 1, Chapter 9 of Diana Temple by Mary Chumley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 9. Is it well with the child? Second Book of Kings, Chapter 4, Verse 26. A happy childhood is one of the best gifts that parents have it in their power to bestow, second only to implanting the habit of obedience, which puts the child in training for the habit of obeying himself later on. A happy childhood is like a welcome into the world. This welcome John never had. No one had been glad to see him when he arrived. No little ring of downy hair had been cut off and treasured. No one came to look at him when he was asleep. No wedded hands were clasped the closer for his coming. The love and awe and pride which sometimes meet over the cradle of a first child were absent from his nursery. The old nurse, who had been his mother's nurse, took him and loved him, and gave herself for him, as is the marvellous way of some women with other people's children. I believe the under-housemaid occasionally came to see him in his bath, and I think the butler, who was a family man himself, gave him a woolly lamb on his first birthday. But excepting the servants and the village people, no one took much notice of John. It is not even on record whether he even crept or what the first word he could say was. It was all chronicled on Mitty's faithful heart, but nowhere else. Mitty was proud when he began to sway and reel on unsteady legs. Mitty walked up and down with him in her arms, night after night, when teeth were coming, crooning little sympathetic songs. Mitty dressed him every afternoon in his best frock, with blue sash and ribbon socks, just like the other children who go downstairs. But John never went downstairs at tea-time never gnawed a lump of sugar with solemn glutinous joy under a parent's eye, or sucked the stiffness out of a rusk before admiring friends. No one sent for John. He was never wanted. Mitty had had troubles. She had buried Mr. Mitty many years ago, and, after keeping a car of her own, had returned to the service of the Fanes, with whom she had lived before her marriage. But I do not think she ever felt anything so acutely as the neglect of her lamb. When Mr. Tempest was expected home, John was put through cheerful and elaborate toilets. His hair, dark and straight, the despair of Mitty's heart, was worked up till it rose like a crest on the top of his head. His bronze shoes, 
which succeeded the knitted socks, were put on. But after these great efforts Mitty always cried bitterly, and kissed John till he cried too for company, and then his smart things would be torn off, and they would go down to tea together in the housekeeper's room. That was a treat. There was society in the housekeeper's room. Mrs. Alcock was very large, spread over with black silk which had a rich aroma of desserts and sweet biscuits. There were in her keeping certain macaroons John knew of, for she was a person of vast responsibilities. He sat on her knees sometimes, but not often, for she breathed and rose and fell all over and creaked underneath her buttons. She was kind, but she was billowy, and the geography of her figure was uncertain, and she could never think of anything to interest him but macaroons, and she was enigmatical as to how the armament was fastened into the top. The butler, Mr. Parker, was estimable, but Mr. Parker, like Mrs. Alcock, was averse to answering questions, even when John inquired why his head was coming through his hair. Charles, the footman, was more amusing, but he never came into the housekeeper's room. It was difficult to see as much of Charles as could be wished. He was really funny when Mitty was not there. He could dance a hornpipe in the pantry. John had seen him do it and Charles was always ready to pull off his coat and give John a ride. What kickings and neighings and prancings there were going upstairs on these occasions! How John clutched round his horse's neck, urging him not to spare himself, till he pressed his charger's shirt-stud into his throat! Once, on a wet day, they went out hunting in the garret gallery, but only once when Mitty was out. And the housemaid with the red cheeks was the fox. Ah! What an afternoon that was! But it came to an end all too soon. Charles wiped his forehead at last, and said the fox was gone to ground, though John knew she was only in the housemaid's closet, giggling among the brooms. That was an afternoon not to be forgotten, not even to be spoilt by the fact that when Mitty and a bag of bull's-eyes came home she was very angry, and called the fox an impudent hussy. Perhaps that event was the first that remained distinctly in his memory. Certainly afterwards people and incidents detached themselves more clearly from the haze of confused memories that preceded it. The following day, as it seemed to John, perhaps in reality many weeks later, he had a vague recollection of a stir in the house, and of seeing various kinds of candles laid out on a table near the storeroom. And then he was in a new black velvet suit with a collar that tickled, and they were in the picture-gallery, he and Mitty, and there were lamps, and all the white sheets were gone from the furniture, and it was all very solemn. And Mitty held his hand tight and told him to be a good boy, and blew his nose for him with a handkerchief of her own that had crumbs in it, and then wiped her eyes and gave him a flower to hold, telling him to be very careful of it. And John was very careful. Years later he could see that flower still. It was a white orchis with maidenhair, and then suddenly a door at the further end of the gallery opened, and a tall man, whom John had seen before, came out. Mitty loosed John's hand and gave him a little push, whispering, "'Go and speak to your papa, and give him the pretty flower.' But John stood stock still and looked at the advancing figure. And the tall gentleman came down the gallery and stopped short rather suddenly when he saw them, and said, "'Well, now it's all flourishing, I hope. Well, John,' and passed on. And Mitty and John were much depressed, and went upstairs again the back way, and Mrs. Alcock met them at the swing door and said she never did. And Mitty cried all the time she undressed him, and he pulled the orchis to pieces, and found on investigation that it had wire inside, and experienced the same difficulty in putting it together again next morning that he had previously found in readjusting the toilet of a dead robin after he had carefully undressed it the night before. After that, Papa became not a familiar but a distinct figure in John's recollection. Papa was seen from the nursery windows to walk up and down the bowling green on the wide plateau in front of the castle where the fountain was, with Neptune reigning in his dolphins in the middle. John was taught by Mitty to kiss his hand to Papa, but Papa, who seldom looked up, was apparently unconscious of these blandishments. He was seen to arrive and to depart. Sometimes other men came back with him, who met John in the gardens, and made delightful jokes, and were almost equal to Charles, only they did not wear livery. 
one event followed close upon another. A lady came to Overley. Bitty and Mrs. Alcock agreed that no lady had ever stayed at Overley since, and then they stopped. And that very evening John was actually sent for to come down to dessert. Charles, who had run up to the nursery during dinner to say so, remarked with a prefatory, Dorks, that wonders would never cease. John was quite ready at the time the message came, sitting in his black velvet suit and his silk stockings and his buckled shoes in his own chair by the fire. He had grown out of several suits while he waited. It was one of the many inexplicable things that he took in wondering silence at the time, that when he wore those particular garments a certain red cushion was always put on the seat of his little cane-bottomed chair. Mitty told him when he inquired into it that that was because of the pattern coming off on his velvets, bless him, and John did not understand, but turned it over in his mind, together with everything he heard, and pondered long beside the nursery fire over many things, and was a very solemn, richly dressed, lonely little boy. He had always been ready, always waiting, when Mr. Tempest was at home. Now, at last, he was sent for. He took it with a stoic calm. Mitty and Charles were much more excited than he was. Even Mrs. Alcock, who had seen too much of the ways of scullery and dairymaids to be capable of being surprised at anything in this world, even she was taken aback. Mitty and he went together down the grand staircase, and the carved figures on the banisters had lamps in their hands, so many lamps that they made him wink, and in the great stone hall there was a blazing log fire, and among the statues there were tall palms and growing things. John was still looking at the white fur rugs upon the stone floor, and counting the claws of the outstretched bear's paws, when Charles came to tell him that dinner was over. The moment had come. Mitty took him to the door, opened it, and pushed him gently in. The dining-hall looked very large and very empty. John had never been in it at night before. A long way off at a little table in the bay window, two people were sitting. A glow of shaded light fell on the table. Mr. Parker was not there. Even Charles, whom John had always considered indispensable in the highest circles, was absent. John walked very slowly across the room, and stopped short in the middle, his strong little hands tightly clasped behind his back on the clean folded pocket handkerchief that Mitty had thrust into them at the last minute. He was not afraid, but he did not know what was going to happen next. The lady turned and looked towards him. She was pale, with white hair, and a sad, beautiful face, as if she had often been very, very sorry. She was older than Mitty and Mrs. Alcock, and Mrs. Evans of the shop, and quite different, very awful to look upon. John was wondering whether she was Queen Victoria, and whether he ought to kneel down. "'Come here, John,' said Mr. Tempest, but John did not stir. "'So this is John,' said the lady, and she put out her wonderful jewelled hand with a very gentle smile, and John went straight up to her at once and stood close beside her, on her gown, in fact. It was not Queen Victoria, it was Mrs. Courtney. After that night a change came over John's life. He was not forgotten any more. Mrs. Courtney, during the few days that she remained at Averley, came up several times to the nursery, and had long conversations with Mitty. John, arrayed in the stiffest of white sailor suits with anchors at the corners, came down to see her in the sunny morning room where his mother's picture hung, and showed her, at her request, his Noah's Ark which Mitty had given him, and afterwards conversed with her on many topics. He repeated to her the hymn Mitty had taught him. When little Samuel awoke, and mentioned Charles to her with high esteem. She was very gentle with him, very courteous. She gave him her whole attention, looking at him with a certain pained compassion. Gradually John unfolded his mind to her. He confided to her his intention of marrying Mitty at a future date, and of presenting Charles at the same time with a set of studs like Mr. Parker's. He was very grave and sedate and every morning shrank back afresh from going to see her, and then forgot his fears in the kind feminine presence and the welcome that was so new and strange and sweet. Once, 
She took him in her arms and held him closely to her. Her eyes were stern through her tears. Poor little fatherless, motherless child, she said, after herself. And she put him down and went to the window and looked out. Looked out across the forest to the valley and over the stretching woods to the long lines of the moors against the sky. Perhaps she was thinking that it would all belong to that little child some day, the home where she had once hoped to see her own daughter live happily, with children growing up about her. Mr. Tempest came into the room at that moment. "'What, John here?' he said. "'Yes,' she replied, and was silent. There was a great indignation in her face. "'Mr. Tempest,' she said at last, "'evil has been done to you not once, but twice. You have suffered heavily at the hands of others. Be careful that someone does not suffer at your hands. Who? Your, Mrs. Courtney hesitated. Your heir. He is my heir, said Mr. Tempest sternly. That is enough. Then do your duty by him, said Mrs. Courtney. You do it to others. Do it also to him. And thenceforward, and until the day of his death, Mr. Tempest did his duty as he conceived it. Never a fraction more, but never a fraction less. John was put early to school. No one went down to see the place before he came to it. No one wrote anxiously about him beforehand, describing his health and his attainments in the Latin grammar. Mr. Goodwin, who was afterwards his tutor, long remembered the arrival of the little, square, bullet-headed boy with a servant, with whom he gravely shook hands on the platform. Mr. Goodwin had come to meet him, and Charles, the last link to home, was parted from in silence. A small luggage was handed over. Once, as they left the station, John looked back. Mr. Goodwin saw the little brown hands clench tightly. John had a trick of clenching his hands as a child, which clung to him throughout life. But he walked on in silence. He was seven years old, and in trousers. Pantalon oblige. Mr. Goodwin, a, a good-natured undermaster, fresh from college, with small brothers at home, respected his silence. Perhaps he divined something of the struggle that was going on under that brand-new little greatcoat of many pockets. Presently John swallowed ominously several times. Mr. Goodwin supposed the usual tears were coming. "'These are very large puddles,' said John suddenly, with a quaver in his voice. "'Large than—' The voice, though not the courage, failed. "'They are, Tempest,' said Mr. Goodwin, "'uncommonly large.' And that was the beginning of a lasting friendship between the two. That friendship took a long time to grow. John was reserved with the reticence that in a child speaks volumes of what the home life has been. He had not the habit of talking to anyone. He listened and obeyed. At first he held aloof from the other boys. Mr. Goodwin advised him to make friends— and John listened in silence. He had never been with boys before. He did not know how. First half he was very lonely. He would have been bullied more than he actually was had he not been so strong and so impossible to convince of defeat. As it was, he took his share with a sort of doggedness, and would have started on the high road to unpopularity in his new little world if he had not turned out good at games. That saved him and before many weeks were over, long, blotted accounts of football and cricket and rackets were written to Mitty and Charles. Mr. Goodwin noticed that the weekly letter to his father never contained any particulars of this kind. There had been a difficulty at first about his correspondence, which, after long pondering upon the same, John had brought to Mr. Goodwin for advice. "'I want to send a letter to someone,' he said one day, when Mr. Goodwin had asked him into his study. Not father. To whom, then? To Mitty. I said I would write. I promised. And he produced a very much blotted paper and spread it before Mr. Goodwin. It's a long letter. It was indeed. The writing had been so severe and the paper so thin that it had worked through to the other side. For Mitty, said John, that is the person it's for. 
and another for Charles with a picture in it. And a second sheet, suggestive of severe manual labour, was produced. I see, said Mr. Goodwin, his hand laid carelessly over his mouth. But, uh, yes, I see, this is for Charles and this for <clears throat> Mitty. And you want them to go today? Yes. John was evidently relieved. He extracted from his trousers pocket two envelopes, not much the worse for seclusion, and laid one by each letter. One envelope was stamped. I had two stamps, he exclaimed. One I put on, and the other I ate in a mistake. I licked it, and then I couldn't find it. Well, we'll put on another, said Mr. Goodwin, who was a person of resources. Now, what next? Shall we put them into the air envelopes? John cautiously assented. And perhaps you would like me to direct them for you? Yes. John certainly had a nice smile. Well, here goes. We'll do Charles first. Who is Charles? He lives with us. He brought me in the train. Really? Well, what is his name? Charles what? He's not Charles anything, said John anxiously. That's just it. He's only Charles. Mr. Goodwin laid down his pen. He saw the difficulty. He must have another name, Tempest, he said. Try and think. I have thought, said John. Before I came to you, I thought. I thought in bed last night. And don't you know Mitty's name, either? No. John's voice was almost inaudible. Dear me, said Mr. Goodwin, smiling, and not realising the gravity of the situation. We can't put Mitty on one letter and Charles on the other. That would never do, would it? There was a moment's silence in which hope went straight out of John's heart. If Mr. Goodwin could not see his way out of the difficulty, who could? He turned red, and then white. His harsh-featured little face took an ugly look of acute distress. "'I said I would write,' he said in a strangled voice. "'I promised Charles in the pantry. It was a faithful promise.' Mr. Goodwin looked up in surprise, and his manner changed. "'Wait a minute,' he said, eagerly. The letters shall go. We will manage it somehow. Is Charles the butler at home? No, that is Mr. Parker. What is he, then? He does things for Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker points, and Charles hands the plates. Footman, perhaps. Yes, said John, with relief. That's Charles. Now, said Mr. Goodwin, with interest, shall we put the footman, Overly Castle, on the envelope? Then it will be sure to reach him. There's Francis. He's a footman, too suggested John, but with dawning hope. Francis might get it, then. He took a kidney once. We will put Charles, the footman, then, said Mr. Goodwin, writing it. Overly Castle, Yorkshire. Now, then, for the other. When I write to father, what do I put at the end? said John, his eyes still riveted on the envelope. J. Tempest, and then something else? Esquire, suggested Mr. Goodwin. "'Yes,' said John. "'I think I should like Charles to be the same as father, please.' Mr. Goodwin added a large esquire after the word footman. "'Now for Mitty,' he said. "'I suppose Mitty is the housekeeper.' "'Why, the housekeeper is Mrs. Alcock,' said John, with a smile at Mr. Goodwin's ignorance. "'There seem to be a good many servants at Overley.' "'Yes,' replied John. "'It is a nice party. We are company to each other. You see—' Father is always away, almost, and he does not play anything when he is at home. Now Charles always does his concertina in the evenings, and Francis is learning the flute. After the direction of the second letter had been finally settled, John licked them carefully up, and looked at them with triumph. "'You must go now,' said Mr. Goodwin. "'I'm busy.' John retreated to the door, and then paused. "'Me and Mitty and Charles are much obliged.' he said, with dignity. "'Don't mention it,' said Mr. Goodwin. But the incident remained in his mind. End of Volume 1, Chapter 9「1, Chapter 10 of Diana Temple by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 1, Chapter 10, 
Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Emerson John was eleven years old when, during a memorable Easter holidays, his father died, and lay in state in the round room in the western tower, and was buried at midnight by torchlight in the little Norman church at Overley, as had been the custom of the tempests from time immemorial. His father's death made very little difference to John, except that his holidays were spent with Miss Fane, an aunt in London, and Charles left to become a butler with a footman under him and the other servants, too, seemed to melt away, leaving only Mitty and Mr. Parker and Mrs. Alcock in the old shuttered home. Mr. Goodwin was John's tutor during the holidays. It was he who saved John's life at the railway station at the risk of his own. No one had been aware, till the accident happened, that John had been particularly attached to his tutor. He evidently got on with him and was conveniently pleased with his society, but he had to a peculiar degree, the stolid, indifferent manner of most schoolboys. He was absolutely undemonstrative, and he tacitly resented his aunt's occasional demonstrative affection to himself. When will unmarried elder people learn that children are not to be deceived? John was very courteous, even as a boy, but his best friends could not say of him, at that or at any later period of his life, that he was engaging. He had through life a cold manner. No one had supposed what really was the case, namely, that he would have given his body to be burned for the sake of the kind, cheerful young man who had taken an easy fancy to him on his arrival at school, and had subsequently become sufficiently fond of him to prefer being his tutor to that of any one else. He guessed John's absolute devotion to himself as little as any one. John's boyish thoughts and feelings and affections were of that shy yet fierce kind which shrink equally from expression and detection. No one had so far found them hard to deal with, because no one had thought of dealing with them. Yet John sat for two days on the stairs outside the sick man's room, after the accident, unnoticed and unreprimanded. He was never seen to cry, but he was, nevertheless, almost unable to see out of his eyes. His aunt, Miss Fane, at whose house in London he was spending his Christmas holidays, had gone down to the country to nurse a sister, and the house was empty but for the servants and the trained nurse. The doctor, who came several times a day, always found him sitting on the stairs, or appearing stealthily from an upper landing, working himself down by the balusters. He said very little, but the doctor seemed to understand the situation, and always had a kind and encouraging word for him, and gave him Mr. Goodwin's love and took messages and offers of his best books from John to the invalid. But during those two long days he always had some excellent reason for John's not visiting his tutor. He was invariably at that moment tired or asleep or resting or... A deep anxiety settled on John's mind. Something was being kept from him. Christmas Day came and passed. Mitty's present and a Christmas card from a friend, the Latin master's youngest daughter, came for John, but they were unopened. The next day brought three doctors who stayed a long time in the drawing-room after they had been in the sick-room. John sat on the stairs with clenched hands. At last he got up deliberately and went into the drawing-room. Two of the doctors were sitting down. One was standing on the hearth-rug looking into the fire. "'It can't be done,' he was saying emphatically. "'Both must go.' All three men turned in surprise as John entered the room. He came up to the fire, unaware of the enormity of the crime he was committing in interrupting a consultation. He tried to speak. He got ready what he wished to ask. But his lips only moved. No words came out. The consultation was evidently finished, for the man on the hearth-rug, who seemed anxious to get away, was buttoning his fur coat and holding his hands to the fire for a last warm. They were very kind. They were not jockos with him, as is the horrible way of some elder persons with childhood's troubles. The old doctor who came daily put his hand on his shoulder and told him Mr. Goodwin had been very ill, but he was going to get better, going to be quite well and strong again presently. John said nothing. He was convinced there was something in the background. Twelve o'clock tomorrow, then,' said the man who was in a hurry, and he took up his hat and went out. 
"'I have two boys about the same age as you,' said the old doctor, patting John's shoulder. "'Tom and Edward. They're making a little model steam engine. I expect you are fond of engines, aren't you?' "'Not just now, thank you,' said John. "'I am sometimes.' "'I wish you would come and see it to-morrow,' continued the doctor. "'They would like to show it to you, I know. I could send you back in the carriage when it has set me down here about, shall we say, twelve. Do come and see it.' "'Thank you,' said John, almost inaudibly. "'You are very kind, but I am engaged.' Miss Fane always said she was engaged when she did not want to accept an invitation, and John supposed it was a polite way of saying he would rather not go. The other doctor laughed, but not unkindly, and the father of Tom and Edward absently drew on his gloves, as if turning over something in his mind. "'Have you seen the new lion and the birds that fly under water at the zoo?' he inquired slowly. "'And the snakes being fed?' "'No,' said John. "'Ah, that's the thing to see,' he said thoughtfully. "'Tom and Edward have been. Dear me how they enjoyed it. They were at feeding time, midday. And my nephew, Harry Austin, who is twenty-one and at college, went with them, and said he would have not missed it for anything. You go and see that with that nice young man who answers the bell. I will send you two tickets to-night. "'Thank you,' said John. The two doctors shook hands with him and departed. "'You may as well keep your tickets,' said the younger one, as they went downstairs. "'He does not mean going.' "'He is a queer little devil,' said Tom's and Edward's father. "'But I like him. There's grit in him, and he watches outside that room like a dog. I wish I could have got him out of the house to-morrow, poor little beggar.' John stood quite still in the middle of the long, empty drawing-room when they were gone. The nameless foreboding of some horrible calamity was upon him. And yet, and yet, they had said he was going to get better, to be quite strong again. He waylaid the trained nurse for the twentieth time, and she said the same. He suffered himself to be taken out for a walk, after hearing from her that Mr. Goodwin wished it, and in the afternoon he consented to go with George, Miss Fane's cheerful, good-natured young footman, to the Christian minstrels. But he lay awake all night, and in the morning after breakfast he crept noiselessly back to the stairs. It was a foggy morning, and the gas was lit. Jessie, the stout, silly housemaid, always in a perspiration or tears, was sweeping the landing just above him, sniffing audibly as she did so. "'Poor young gentleman,' she was saying below her breath to her colleague, "'I can't bear the thought of the operation. It seems to turn my inside clean upside down.' John clutched hold of the banisters. His heart gave one throb, and then stood quite still. "'The Coleman says there's both his hands must go,' said the other maid, also in a whisper. "'She told me herself. She says she's never seen such a case all her born days. They'd be trying all along to save one, but they can't. They're to be took off to-day.' John understood at last. He slipped downstairs again, and stood a moment in hesitation where to go not to the little back room on the ground floor, which had been set apart for his use by his aunt. He might be found there. George might come in to see if he would fancy a game of battledore and shuttlecock, or the cook might step up with a little cake, or the butler himself might bring him a comic paper. The servants were always very kind, but he felt that he could not bear any kindness just now. He must be somewhere alone by himself. The drawing-room door was locked, but the key was on the outside. He turned it cautiously and went in. The room was dark and fiercely cold. Bands of yellow fog peered in over the tops of the shutters. The room had been prepared the day before for the consultation, but now it had returned to its former shuttered, muffled state. John took the key from the outside and locked himself in. Then he flung himself on his face onto one of the muffled settees and stuffed the dust-sheet into his mouth. Anything not to scream. A low, strangled cry was wrenched out of him. Another, and another, and another, but the dust-sheet told no tales. He dragged it down with him onto the floor, and bit into the wet, cobwebby material. And by degrees the paroxysm passed. The power to keep silence returned. At last John sat up and looked round him, breathing hard. 
a clock ticked in the darkness, and presently struck a single chime. Half past something, half past eleven it must be, and they were coming at twelve. Was there no help? God, said John suddenly, in a low, distinct voice in the darkness, do something. If you don't stop it, nobody else will. You know you can, if you like. You divided the Red Sea. Remember all your plagues. Oh, God, God, make something happen. There's half an hour still. Think of him. Both hands. And all the clever books he was going to write, and all the things he was going to do. Oh, God, God, and such a cricketer. There was a short silence. John felt absolutely certain God would answer. He waited a long time, but no one spoke. The fog deepened outside. The quarter struck faintly from the church in the next street. "'I give up one hand,' said John, stretching out both of his. "'I only ask for one now. Let him keep one, the other one. He's so clever. He could soon learn to write with his left, and perhaps hooks don't hurt after the first. Oh, God! I dare say he could manage with one. But not both, not both. John repeated the last words over and over again in an agony of supplication. He would make God hear. It was growing very dark. The link boys were crying in the streets. A carriage stopped at the door. Oh, God, they're coming! Not both, not both! gasped John, and the sweat broke from his forehead. Two more carriages. Lowered voices in the passage, and quiet footfalls going upstairs. John prayed without ceasing. The house had become very silent. At last the silence awed him, and an overmastering longing to know seized upon him. He stole out of the drawing-room, and sped swiftly upstairs. On the landing opposite Mr. Goodwin's room the butler was standing, listening. Everything was quite still. John could hear the gas burning. There was a can of hot water just outside the door. The steam curled upwards out of the spout. As he reached the landing, the door was softly opened, and the nurse raised the heavy can and lifted it into the room. Through the open door came a hoarse, inarticulate sound, which seemed to pierce into John's brain. "'Courage!' said a gentle voice, and the door was closed again. The butler breathed heavily, and there was a whimper from the upper landing. Trembling from head to foot, John fled down the stairs again, unperceived, into the drawing-room, and crouched down on the floor near the open door, turning his face to the wall. Every now and then a strong shudder passed over him, and he beat his little black head dumbly against the wall. But he did not move, until at last the doctors came down. He let the first two pass. He could not speak to them, and it was a long time before the father of Tom and Edward appeared. John came suddenly out upon him at the turn of the stairs. "'Is it both?' he said, clutching his coat. "'Both what, my boy?' said the doctor, puzzled by the sudden onslaught, and looking down at the blackened, convulsed face and shaggy hair. "'Both hands!' The doctor hesitated. "'Yes,' he said gravely. I am grieved to say it is. John flung up his arms. I will never pray to God again as long as I live, he said passionately. John, said the doctor sternly, and then suddenly putting out his hand to catch him as he reeled backwards. What good gracious the child has fainted! John went back to school before the holidays were over, for Miss Fane on her return found it difficult to know what to do with him. Mr. Goodwin came back no more. He slowly regained a certain degree of health, a ruined man, without private means, at seven-and-twenty. John wrote constantly to him, and wrote also long, urgent letters in a large, cramped hand to his trustees. And something inadequate was done. When he came of age, his first action was to alter that something, and to induce Mr. Goodwin and the sister who lived with him to take up their abode in the chaplain's house in the park at Overley, where they had now been established nearly seven years. Whether John's was an affectionate nature or not, it would be hard to say, 
for affection had so far intermeddled little with his life. But he had a kind of faithfulness, and a memory of the heart as well as of the head. John never forgot a kindness, never wholly forgot an injury. He might forgive one, for he showed as he grew towards man's estate and passed through the various vicissitudes of school and college life, a certain stern generosity of temper and contempt for small retaliations. He was certainly not revengeful, but he remembered. His mind was as tenacious of impression as engraved steel. That very tenacity of impression had given Mr. Goodwin an unbounded influence over him in his early youth. John had believed absolutely in Mr. Goodwin, and Mr. Goodwin, hurried by a bitter short cut of suffering from youth to responsible middle age, had devoted himself with the religious fervour of entire self-abnegation to the boy for whom he had risked his life. John's intense attachment to him had, after his recovery, come as a surprise to him, yoked with a sense of responsibility. For to be loved in any fashion is to incur a great responsibility. Mr. Goodwin acted according to his lights. But the good intentions of others cannot pave the way to heaven for us. In the manner of many well-meaning teachers, Mr. Goodwin used his influence over John to impress upon him the stamp of his own narrow religious convictions. He honestly believed it was the best thing he could do for the young, strong, earnest nature which sat at his feet. But John did not sit long. Mr. Goodman was aghast at the way in which the little chains and check-strings of his scheme of salvation were snapped like thread when John began to rise to his feet. An influence misused, if once shaken, is lost for ever. John went away like a young Samson, taking the poor weaver's inadequate beam with him, and never came back. Mr. Goodwin's teaching had done its work. John never leaned again on one mind overmuch. Mr. Goodwin pushed him early into scepticism, into which narrow teaching pushes all independent natures, and regarded his success with bitter disappointment. John left him, and Mr. Goodwin's office others took. Mr. Goodwin suffered horribly. John had not, of course, reached seven-and-twenty without passing through many phases, each more painful to Mr. Goodwin than the last. He had spoken fiercely at Oxford on one occasion in favour of community of goods, to the surprise and amusement of his friends, and on one other single occasion in support of the philosophy of Kant, with which he did not agree, but whose side he could not bear to see inefficiently taken up only for the sake of refutation. When the spirit moved him, John could be suddenly eloquent, but the spirit very seldom did. As a rule he saw both sides with equal clearness, and could be forced into partnership on neither. Those who expected he would make a brilliant speaker in the House of Commons would probably be disappointed in him. It was remarkable, considering he had apparently no special talent or aptitude for any one line of study, and had never particularly distinguished himself either at school or college, that nevertheless he had unconsciously raised in the minds of those who knew him best, and many who did not know him at all, a more or less vague expectation that he would make his mark, that in some fashion or other he would come to the fore. The abilities of persons with square jaws are usually taken for granted by the crowd and certainly John's was square enough to suggest any amount of reserved force. But general expectation rarely falls on those who have sufficient strength not only to resist its baneful influence, but also to realise its hopes. The effect of the expectation of others on many minds is to draw into greater activity that personal conceit which, once indulged, saps the roots of individual life and gradually vitiates the powers. Conceit is only mediocrity in the bud. Like a blight in spring it stunts the autumn fruit. On some natures, again, the expectation of others acts as a stimulus, the force of which is quite incalculable. It spurs a natural humility into fixed resolution and self-reliance, turns sloth into energy, earnestness into action, and goads diffidence up the hills of achievement. It has been truly said that those who trust us 
educate us. Perhaps it might be added that those who believe in us make or destroy us. If John, who was perfectly aware of the enthusiastic or grudging expectations that others had formed of him, had not as yet fallen into either of these two extremes, it was probably because what others might happen to think or not think concerning him was of little moment to him, and had no power to sway him either way. The thing of all others that puzzled John's staunchest adherents was their inability to fix him in any one set of opinions, social, political, or religious. Many after Mr. Goodwin tried and failed. For John's great wealth and position, besides the native force of character of which even as a very young man he gave signs, and an openness of mind which encouraged what it ought to have disheartened proselytism, all these attributes have made him an object of interest and importance which would have ruined a more self-conscious man. As it was, he listened, got to the bottom of the subject, whatever it might be, never left it till he had probed to the uttermost, and then went his way. He marched out of every mental prison he could be temporarily lured into. He would go boldly into any that interested him, but locks and bars would not hold him directly he did not wish to stay there any longer. Mr. Goodwin hoped against hope that John would see the error of his ways and come back, that, according to his mode of expressing himself, the pride of the intellect might be broken, and John might one day be moved to return from the desert and husks and the philosophy of free thought to his father's home. He said something of the kind one day to John, and was astonished at the sudden flame that leapt into the young man's eyes as he silently took up his hat and went out. The one thing of all others which the Mr. Goodwins of this world are incapable of discerning is that to leave an outgrown form of faith is in itself an act of faith almost beyond the strength of shrinking human frailty. To bury a dead belief is hard. They regard it invariably as a voluntary desertion, not of their form of religion, but of a religion itself for private ends, or from a sense of irksomeness. Mr. Goodwin had reproachfully suggested that John had got into a bad set at Oxford, and was in the habit of mixing in doubtful society in London. Those whose surroundings have moulded them attribute all mental changes in others to a superficial and generally an entirely inadequate influence such as would have had little power to affect themselves. John left the house white with anger. He had been anxious and humble half an hour before. He had listened sadly enough to Mr. Goodwin's counsels, the old, old counsels that fortunately always come too late, that are worse than none because they appeal to motives of self-interest, safety, peace of mind, etc., the pharisaical reasoning that what has been good enough for our fathers is good enough for us. But now his anger was fierce against his teacher, who was so quick to believe evil of any development not of his own fostering. He calls good evil and evil good, he said to himself. It seems to me I have only got to lose hold of the best in me and lead a cheap goody-goody sort of life, and I should please everybody all round, Mr. Goodwin included. He wants me to remain a child always. He would break my mind to pieces now if he could, and would offer up the little bits to God. He thinks the voice of God in the heart is a temptation of the devil. I will not silence it and crush it down as he wants me to. I will love, honour, and cherish it from this day forward, for better for worse, for richer for poorer, in sickness and in health. There seems to be in life a call which comes to a few only, who, like the young man of the gospel, have great possessions. From youth up the life may have been carefully lived in certain well-worn grooves traced by the finger of God, grooves in which many are allowed to pass their whole existence. But to some among those many, to some few with great mental possessions, the voice comes sooner or later, Forsake all, leave all, and follow me. How many turn away sorrowful? They cannot believe in the New Testament of the present day. They ponder instead what God whispered eighteen hundred years ago in the ear of a listening son, but they shrink from recognizing the same voice speaking in their hearts now, completing all that has gone before. 
and so the point of life is missed. The individual life, namely the life of Christ, obedient not to Scripture, but to the giver of the Scripture, is not lived. The life Christ lived, at variance with the recognized faiths and fashionable opinions of the day, a variance just because it did not conform to a dead ritual, just because it was obedient throughout to a personal prompting. That life is not more tolerated today than it was eighteen hundred years ago. The Church will have none of it, treats the first spark of it as an infidelity to Christ himself. Against every young and ardent listening and questioning soul, the Church and the world combine, as in our Lord's day, to crucify once again the Christ. Life which is not of their kindling, which is indeed an infidelity, but an infidelity only to them. So the crucifix is raised high. The sign of our great rejection of him is deified. The Mediator, the Saviour, the Redeemer is honoured. The instrument of his death is honoured. But the thought for the sake of which he was content to stretch his nailed hands upon it, his thought, is without honour. Poor Mr. Goodwin, poor John. Affection had to struggle along as best as it could as the years widened the gulf between them, and was reduced to find a meagre subsistence in cordial words and sympathy for neuralgia on John's part, and interest in John's shooting and hunting on Mr. Goodwin's. Affectionate and easy terms were gradually re-established between them, and a guarded sympathy on general subjects returned. But Mr. Goodwin knew that, from being the friend of the inner, he had become only the companion of the outer life of the person he cared for most in the world, and the ways of providence appeared to him inscrutable. And now Mr. Goodwin understood John even less at seven-and-twenty than at twenty-one. The conception of the possibility of a mind that, after being strongly influenced by a succession of the most dangerous teachers and books, gives final allegiance to none, and can at last elect to stand alone, was impossible to Mr. Goodwin. And yet John arrived at that simple and natural result, of which those who have sincerely and humbly searched for a law and an authority outside themselves do arrive. An external authority is soon seen to be too good to be true. There is no court of appeal against the verdict of the inexorable judge who dwells within. How many rush hither and thither, and wear down the patience of earnest counsellors, and whittle away all the best years of their lives to nothingness, in fretting and scratching among ruins, for the law by which they may live. They look for it in Bibles, in the minds of anxious friends, who turn out everything to help them, in the face of nature, who betrays the knowledge of the secret in her eyes, but who utters it not. And last of all, a remnant of the many, look in their own hearts, where the great law of life has been hidden from the beginning. David says, Yea, thy law is within my heart. A greater than David said the same. But it is buried deep, and few there be that find it. End of chapter 10